The crisis in Crimea continues to unfold. What do Crimea, Ukraine, Westphalia, Nuremberg, and Texas all have to do with each other? I'm going to tell you. And by the way, guess who was nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize? Ah, this is the voice of resistance. Standing for truth in the four corners of America. Fighting for justice on the frontiers of the culture wars. And turning resistance into an art form. Randall Terry. The situation with Ukraine, Crimea, Russia, Western nations continues to move at a very rapid pace. My intention in today's program is to give you a historical backdrop along with some international relations political philosophy, all right? The, the principles that govern or, or fail to govern certain situations involving independence and self-government and non-intervention. Now, the parliament of Crimea, right? Again, look at the map and see that Crimea borders Russia and is right now part of the Ukraine. The parliament of Crimea voted 78 to zero with eight abstentions to hold a referendum. I'm going to read to you the two questions of the referendum. One translation says, do you support Crimea's reunification with Russia? Or, question two, do you support the restoration of the constitution of the Crimean Republic dated 1992 and Crimea's status as a part of Ukraine? Here's another translation because we are at the mercy of translators. Number, question number one, do you support reunification of Crimea with Russia as a constituent member of the Russian Federation? Or question two, do you support the reinstatement of the 1992 constitution of the Republic of Crimea and Crimea's status as part of Ukraine? Now, for those of you glazing over going, well, who cares what this have to do with me? Hold on. The principles that are being debated here could have a real impact on us one day here in the United States. What do you mean, Randall? Well, think about Texas. Texas boasts itself as the only independent nation to ever come into the Union, which is not exactly historically accurate, but let's roll with it for a minute. Texas, the Republic of Texas, voted to come into the Union. The Union said, yes, we'll take you, and Texas became a part of the United States. But a part of their agreement, their treaty to come into the Union, in that agreement, they retained the right to secede from the Union. All right? So what if the Texas legislature had a vote to withdraw from America? I mean, you understand that we have a federal government and we have state governments. So Ukraine has a national government and then they also have governments that are their, their local states or their local republics or the local regions, whatever they call them or whatever the press translates them as. So. The Crimean parliament voted 78 to zero to become a part of the Russian Federation. But they also said, but we're going to put it to a vote to the people. So question one says, we're going to go for reunification because remember, as we've discussed here, Crimea used to be a part of Russia and was given to Ukraine by Khrushchev in the mid 1950s. All right. So question one is, do we go back to mother Russia? Question two is, no, do we retain our 1992 constitutional status as a republic that is confederated or a part of Ukraine? So we're going to see what happens. The Ukrainian interim government is crying foul. The Republicans are saying this is completely legitimate. The U.S. is saying we're, we think that this is not legitimate. Well, hold on, John Kerry. Hold on. You can't have it both ways. You can't have it both ways. I mean, is self-determination legitimate or not? I mean, is this the Abraham Lincoln school of we've got to keep the union at all costs and if any states want to secede, 
we're going to physically, violently, with military force, keep them in Ukraine? All right. This stuff is interesting, and it actually is critical, but critical because the principles at stake here govern both foreign policy in America and domestic policy, or what we do here at home. And there could be bloodshed. There could be more blood, bloodshed. There could be ramifications for people in Europe, in Russia, in Eastern Europe. It could involve people's heat, their livelihoods, whether people freeze it. I mean, this is, this is not a small deal, okay? So we want to look at it and also provide you with a history lesson so you can understand how the Germans could be butchering Jews in the 1930s and no one intervenes to do anything. Or in Rwanda in the 1990s, the Hutus could be slaughtering the Tutsis and President Bill Clinton looks the other way. What possesses these men to intervene one minute and to not intervene in another? We'll talk about it when we come back. This is the voice of resistance. You have two choices. I mean, you can try to raise your children by design or you will raise them by default. There are no perfect parents. We're gonna get it wrong sometimes. If we have a plan, we've got a better chance of getting it right in the long run. There is something deep within the heart of every human being that longs for parental acceptance and approval. When does a boy become a man? Get a group of guys around and ask them that question. I don't think there's a certain age. Some men stay boys their whole life. I would say, uh, what, 16, 18 years old? Wow, that's a good question. When they get bar mitzvah? Well, I think when he has a child. So I just became at 56, yeah, 56 years old. Without the power of the Holy Spirit changing us and giving us power over our sin, we can't hope to be the dads that our kids need us to be. Democratic presidential hopeful Hillary Clinton, though she hasn't announced, we can believe she's going to run. She may have put herself in a very awkward position by comparing Russia's president, Vladimir Putin, to Hitler. Yes. You know, I, I have to say that as somebody who has frequently referred to Adolf Hitler and used the Nazis as an illustration of how the baby killers in America are, are murdering the innocent and the American Holocaust, I respect someone who throws out Hitler just willy-nilly. The problem is, is that if she wants to be president, it's not a good footing to get off on to compare Putin to Hitler. Now, why would she even do that? Again, a little bit of history. In 1938, uh, the Germans participated in the assassination of the Austrian leader and then held what is known historically as the Anschluss. It was a plebiscite, it was a, a referendum, it was a vote in which the people of Austria could decide if they wanted reunification with Germany because most of the people in Austria at that time were of German descent. And of course, for those of you who know the history, 98, 99% of the people who showed up for the vote said that they, yes, wanted to be a part of Germany. And Hence, this referendum with Crimea saying that it wants to be reunited with Russia. Uh, Hillary is making a kind of fast and loose comparison between Russian president, who was elected, by the way, Vladimir Putin, with Hitler. I would much sooner, much sooner compare Barack Obama with his murderous agenda and his state apparatus to spy on all of us. I'd much rather compare Barack Obama with Adolf Hitler, but, but, but I digress. All right, non-intervention. You're gonna hear that word in the press thrown around once in a while. What does it mean, all right? This is really critical. Non-intervention means that a nation can do what it wants in its internal borders and outside nations will not intervene, all right? The doctrine of non-intervention was the outgrowth 
of a treaty signed several hundred years ago called the Treaty of Westphalia or the Peace of Westphalia. It's from 1648. Again, you might go, well, what does that have to do with us? It has a lot to do with us. A lot to do with us. First of all, it has to do with our religious freedom. The Treaty of Westphalia, the Peace of Westphalia, was because the nations, the Spaniards especially, and the Dutch, and there were other nations, kept intervening internally. They would send in armies over what religion the nations of Europe had. And so religious freedom, as we understand it today, that the people of a nation can practice their religion as they want, and it could be Catholic, Protestant, Orthodox, Jewish, whatever, that comes from the Peace of Westphalia from 1648. So it bears on us. And, but what happened was, is that was, what was originally meant to start the Thirty Years' War, which was predominantly religious wars, it ended up becoming that any nation can do whatever it wants inside of its borders and nobody's going to intervene. Fast forward to the 1930s when Germany, the Nazis, when they were butchering the Jews and the gypsies and various Christians and trade unionists and communists. After the war was over, the principle of non-intervention was so entrenched in international relations that there were people that were actually suggesting, well, we can't do anything to the leaders of the Nazis for what they did to their own people, because after all, it's their own people, and what they did was legal, right? It was all according to the law, the German law at the time. And so the victors at the trial known as the Nuremberg Trials said, in effect, we're going to leapfrog back to the, the, the theory of Augustinian war, all right, just war, and that we are going to, they, they literally referenced the scriptures, the laws of God, and said, we're going to hold these people accountable. Because even though what they did was legal under German law, it was still a crime against humanity. It was a crime against the laws of God. All right. So, non-intervention. The West is saying, we shouldn't allow Russia to intervene in Crimea's affairs. If you ever heard of the Monroe Doctrine, there are times when America's hypocrisy is bewildering. Do you know what the Monroe Doctrine is? Do you know what it states? Do you know when it's been invoked? Do you know what it's meant for our neighbors to the south? I'm going to tell you when I get back. You're going to learn something because this is the voice of resistance. Do you want to have knowledge, wisdom, discernment? If so, you have to read good books on theology, history, books that look at the lives of great men and women. So to help you to become a more effective Christian, a better witness for truth, somebody who can engage in productive conversation that exhorts and edifies those that you speak with, we're going to do something crazy. We're offering you these seven books for a gift of any size. You just pay for the shipping and handling and then give whatever gift that you can and we will send them to you. But just to make it a little bit more crazy, I will send you a second copy of my three books autographed. You can give them as a gift to your pastor or to a family member and help extend truth and justice in the world. This is While Supplies Last. As America and other Western European nations say that Russia's got no interest doing anything in Crimea or in Ukraine, there is an argument that the people there should have autonomy, okay? But hear me, autonomy Self-government is not absolute. It is not an absolute right, okay? For example, if a majority of people in a government, or in a state rather, form a government, and in that government they decide that they are going to kill off a minority, such as in Rwanda, with the Hutus slaughtering the Tutsis, can they say, you can't intervene, we voted, we have autonomy? Of course not, all right? 
It's not an absolute. There are things that are higher than that. The laws of God are higher than that. And that, my friend, is a part of the foundation of the Augustinian, St. Augustine, all right, from the late 300s and early 400s. That is a part of the Augustinian theory of just war, that a nation can, for the sake of justice, intervene in the affairs of another nation, no matter what that other nation has decided with autonomy or with self-government or with a legitimate vote, okay? Democracy is not higher than the laws of God. You cannot vote with a majority to upend the laws of God. No. All right, so, not to mention history and philosophy and Augustine, but how about the Monroe Doctrine? All right, let me read to you a portion of the message to Congress that President, American President James Monroe sent to Congress in 1823. All right, December of 1823. Now, the background here is that there was quarrels going on between France and Spain and Portugal on this side and Russia and Prussia and Austria on the other side. These are things long forgotten by most of us, but the Monroe Doctrine is not. Because what was happening was that France and Spain were discussing ways that some of the lost colonies in the Americas, Central America, South America, some of their territories, some of their properties could be brought back to their orbit, okay? So James Monroe sent a message to Congress and in it, this is the heart and soul of the Monroe Doctrine. You ready? We owe it therefore to candor and to the amicable relations existing between the United States and those powers, the powers of Europe, Russia, etc., to declare that we should consider any attempt on their part to extend their system to any portion of this hemisphere as dangerous to our peace and safety. With the existing colonies or dependencies of any European power, we have not interfered and shall not interfere. But with the governments who have declared their independence and maintained it, and whose independence we have on great consideration and on just principles acknowledged, we could not view any interposition for the purpose of oppressing them or controlling them in any other manner their destiny by any European power in any other light than as the manifestation of an unfriendly disposition toward the United States. In other words, if France or Spain tries to take back over a nation, if the Spaniards want to get Peru back under their control or Venezuela or Costa Rica or anything, we say, no, we consider this an act of war against us. We, the United States, have determined that we're going to control the entire hemisphere. Okay? Now, at the beginning, when that happened, a lot of the Latin American countries were saying, yay, they're going to protect our independence. Well, they, many of them are not so happy about the Monroe Doctrine anymore. In fact, in, in the fall of 2013, Secretary of State John Kerry told the uh, organization of American states that the Monroe Doctrine is dead. Now, uh, for those of you who, who follow American politics, it'll just take a strong-willed Republican president instead of a weak-kneed Democrat like Barack Obama. It'll just take one Republican president to say, there's been a resurrection. The Monroe Doctrine is not dead. It's alive. So the, the simple matter is, though, that the Monroe Doctrine was used on many occasions by many presidents to justify our intervention in Latin American countries by ways that we saw fit. So many of the Latin American countries today view the Monroe Doctrine as uh, an effort by the U.S. to have hegemony. In other words, we want the whole region, the whole Western Hemisphere, all of the Americas to look like we Americans want it to look like. And they don't like that. But that's our foreign policy, the foreign policy that we've lived with for almost 200 years. And we cannot therefore say to Russia, well, we have the Monroe Doctrine. We tell everyone that what they're going to do or not do in this hemisphere within limits. And we're, but, but you can't say what's going to happen in Crimea, even though it borders you. You can't say what's going to happen in Ukraine. You have no legitimate interest there. Yes, they do. All right. And as I've stated before, Crimea was a part of Russia that was ceded to Ukraine during the Soviet Empire as a perfunctory political move. And 
the majority of the people in Crimea are Russian. So they're going to get a chance to vote. They're going to vote. Do you want to become a state in the Russian Federation or do you want to be semi-autonomous and related to Ukraine? There's your vote, John Kerry. There's your vote, President Obama. Are you going to say to them that they can't do it? Are you going to say that we should send arms? That we should punish Russia economically? I mean, watch this carefully, people, because there's a lot of people in the United States that would like independence from the United States, right? There is a very strong secessionist movement in Texas and in other states. Heck, four counties in the Oklahoma panhandle actually voted to secede from the union. Those are the four counties, by the way, where when I ran for president against Obama in the Democratic primary, I beat him in all four of those counties. I'm waiting. If you need me to become the president of those, those four counties, I'm interested in the position. This is the voice of resistance. I'll be right back. Do you want to get America out of the hands of wicked and unjust men and women who are destroying the Republic before our eyes and put leadership back into the hands of righteous men and women so that we don't die as a nation? Well, you're talking about social revolution and there are rules in social revolution. We can look at the victorious social revolutions of the past, such as the end of slavery, the end of child labor, women's voting rights, the end of segregation, and so much more, and learn from their victories. Look at their actions, their images, their rhetoric, their sacrifices, and their final fruit. We will send you this series that originally cost $129, seven books for students, one teacher's guide, if you'll give a gift of any size and just pay for shipping and handling. Take advantage of it today. In a fun twist of fate, Russian President Vladimir Putin has been nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize. Other nominees have withdrawn their names or asked that their names not be made public, at least not printed in Russian. All right. Um, I want to read to you from the history of the Peloponnesian War by the Greek historian Thucydides. This is the chapter on the Melian Dialogue. Randall, once again, what does that have to do with us? Well, America's foreign policy, at least with a lot of our real politic, such as Henry Kissinger advocated, uh, much of America's policy is based upon this. Here's a phrase. You know as well as we do that right, as the world goes, is only a question between equals in power while the strong do what they can and the weak suffer what they must. The Melian Dialogue was a conversation between the Athenians and the leaders of the island of Milos. The Athenians were basically going to take it over and they said, look, you can surrender and we'll treat you properly or we are going to destroy you. And the concept of right makes right is connected with this passion. It's worth looking at. If you want to be a leader, if you want to know what we should do in the future, you have to know how we got here. A good leader understands the past, sees the trajectory of how we got here, and therefore can see where we're going and what alterations need to be made. If you want to understand what's going on with international relations and all the wringing of the hands and people crying out, this is a violation of international law. Well, not really. If, if you want to be able to engage that and see what steps and missteps America is making or Russia is making or the European nations are making, knowing history is a good thing. Look up that fancy dude. At least his bust is fancy. Um, all right. Keep praying for the people of Ukraine. Keep praying for justice and peace to reign in the area. And I, I'm going to make a prediction. It's a foregone conclusion. Crimea is going back to Russia because that's where its history lies and that's where its safety lies and that's where the Russian port is. The Russian ships lie there. They're not giving it up. 